I don't want to uh, waste too much time with a big wind-up, and I know that everybody here has already been busy today uh, doing some terrific work. I just want to, first of all, thank Jeff, and I want to thank all of you uh, for your willingness to participate in our Jobs Council. Uh, just in terms of genesis, I think many of you are aware of the fact that two years ago we set up uh, a business advisory group to help guide us through uh, a crisis that we hadn't, of, of the sort that we hadn't seen since the Great Depression. Uh, mostly focused on the financial sector, figuring out how we stabilize that and how we make sure that the credit markets are working and how we uh, averted a, a Great Depression. Uh, we have done that. The economy is now growing. Uh, in many sectors, uh, we're seeing recovery. Uh, but the biggest challenge that we're seeing right now is the fact that uh, unemployment is still way too high all across the country. And so what we wanted to do was retool it's critical for us to have input from folks who are actually hiring, putting people to work, making payroll, uh, making the products and services that uh, uh, make uh, our economy so, uh, so powerful. Uh, but we want to make sure that we narrow the focus to think about how do we ensure, A, that we're uh, putting people to work right now, uh, but also how do we lay the foundation uh, for us to win uh, the future over the long term. Uh, this is obviously a theme that I talked about during uh, the State of the Union. Uh, it is my belief that we have all the pieces in place for us to make sure that the 21st century is the American century just like the 20th was. But we're going to have to up our game uh, in this newly competitive world. Uh, and that means that we've got to out-educate uh, every other country in the world. We're going to have to out-innovate uh, every country in the world. We've got to uh, make sure that we've got the best infrastructure to move people and, and goods and services uh, throughout the economy. Uh, I want us to be an economy that is not simply buying uh, from other people and borrowing to do it. Uh, I want us to be selling to other people uh, and uh, having some other folks owe us some money. Uh, and so it is going to be absolutely critical for us during a period of uh, significant fiscal constraint that we create the kind of public-private partnership that makes that happen. And it's going to be very important for us to get ideas from people who have actually uh, are, are actually on the ground right now uh, trying to build your businesses uh, and uh, operate in an extraordinarily competitive uh, world. So uh, my main purpose here today at this first meeting, I think, is to listen, uh, to get a sense of where all of you think the economy is right now, what kinds of steps uh, we need to be taking, as I talked about during uh, the State of the Union, we want to remove any barriers and any impediments that are preventing from, uh, you from success and from growth. At the same time, we want to uh, put a challenge uh, to America's businesses that uh, even as we're working with you to streamline regulations, uh, to reform our tax system, uh, to take other steps that uh, have been sitting on the shelf for quite some time uh, under both Democratic and Republican presidents, we want to make sure that we're also putting a uh, a little pressure on you guys to figure out uh, how do we make sure that the economy is working for everybody? How do we make sure that every child out there who's willing to work hard is going to be able to succeed? Uh, how do we make certain that uh, working families uh, across the country are sharing in growing productivity uh, and that uh, we're not uh, simply creating an economy in which one segment of it's doing very well, uh, but the rest of the folks are out there treading water? So, uh, Jeff, again, I want to thank you for uh, your extraordinary work. Uh, I want to thank uh, all of you for uh, uh, agreeing to participate. Uh, last point I'll make is that uh, I'm not interested in, uh, in photo ops and I'm not interested uh, in more meetings. I've got enough photo ops and enough meetings. Uh, I have a surplus of that. Uh, so I expect this to be a working group in which we are coming up with some concrete deliverables. Uh, I don't think that we have to be trying to hit home runs every time. I think if we hit some singles and doubles, uh, if we uh, find some very specific things that uh, this group can uh, help us on and, and we can work on together, uh, then we can build on that success. Uh, and uh, in the aggregate over time, uh, this will have really made a difference uh, at a critical juncture in our economy. So thank Great. you very much. And with that, I'm going to turn it over Great. to you, Jeff. Thanks, Mr. President. And, uh, you know, again, what, what I'll do is kind of frame 
where the council will focus. And then we've got a, a chance to talk about the broader economy with some of the team uh, sharing ideas. But I'd make, I'd make five points. The first one is uh, I think we've got a very good team assembled. We had a chance to listen to each other this morning. Uh, it's a diverse team. You've got, you've got people that run businesses that are just based in the United States. You've got globally oriented companies, export oriented companies. We've got small business, big business. We've got technology sector, services sector. Uh, uh, we've got a broad variety of opinions and we've got uh, strong minded people that are gonna say what's on their mind. So I think we've started the right way by assembling a diverse group that can give you a good perspective on the economy and good ideas and counsel in terms of how do we make uh, the economy better. So I, I want to say thanks publicly to everybody that's here today and, and I'm, I'm glad to be a part of this group. I really like the way it's come together. Point number two, there's universal agreement on the council this morning and I think all of us want this to be laser-like focus on creating American jobs that, that basically we don't like the cynicism that exists uh, in the economy today, that we view that we share the responsibility uh, in the private sector, in the, in the private markets to do the things that are important to create jobs in this country, good jobs. Competitiveness is a launching pad for that and that we have to stay focused in a global economy on competitiveness. but. Uh, I think we all want this to stand for something, and pretty generally, I would say the group wants it to stand for an aspirational focus on creating good jobs. So that's point number two. Mm -hmm. Point number three, we had a lot of discussion on topics today and what would be the critical areas of focus, and I think we're gonna be able to come together pretty quickly on, on key areas of uh, both practical, tactical, short-term approaches to maybe pull through and create jobs, to education, uh, uh, global trade, uh, immigration, uh, a whole series of ideas that I think we can bring short and long-term solutions, uh, you know, investments in R&D, energy, things like that. We want to be practical, so we want to stay focused on those things that can be accomplished, but at the same time, we want to try to do some work on some building blocks that can drive long-term competitiveness. So I would say we, we, we will come to grips with a real focus that has both a short-term and long-term payback and that, and that I think with the group here, people have different areas of expertise and different opinions on where we should start, but there's generally a view that there's seven or eight general areas that are gonna have the biggest yield and that's where we wanna stay focused. Uh, point number four, we want to have a process that you are a, uh, you know, uh, right in the middle of, you know, we, we basically see this in a 90-day kind of process. We, we, we want to share our outputs and ideas with you uh, on that time frame that, that have very specific proposals. We're, we'll work closely uh, from a standpoint of what else is going on uh, from a macro standpoint, but we very much want this to have a, a rhythm and an output that keeps us on track, makes it relevant, and again, shows that we can use the council as a launching pad for both substantive ideas, maybe longer term public, public, uh, public policy. The fifth point I'd make, uh, Mr. President, is just one on outreach. You know, each one of us has geographic and industry constituencies that we can leverage very hard. I think a lot of this activity, in fact, most of this activity is gonna happen outside Washington. We, we want to have sessions that are in the field. We want to have outreach sessions that are, uh, I think, reaching out to our supply chain and various constituencies that are, that are with us. Uh, so a big part of this is going to be about tone and about outreach and about, I would say, shared responsibility to improve the economy for the long term and create jobs and competitiveness. And so, Good people, you know, both industrially and also uh, uh, Rich and Joe from the labor side. I think we, we, we've done a good job there. Real focus on jobs. Topics that are, that are relevant, both short and long term. Discipline process. And, uh, and a real focus on tone and outreach. I'd say those are the five things that we are gonna put in place, you know, as we, as we come from this session and move uh, forward in the future. Good. So that's that's uh, council that I capture the team.
Good. Good job. Yeah. This may be the only time we agree, but uh, that's, <laughs> that's okay too. Fantastic. Well, I, I, uh, my understanding is we've got a couple we're of. We're going to whip around, maybe to, to go around and talk a little bit about what's going on in the economy. Lou, I thought I'd start with you in the uh, utility sector. Okay, I'm a bit of a rookie at this sort of thing, so I, I hope I will hit the mark. Uh, you gave me plenty of lead time, like 6.30 last night. Come <laughs> <laughs> You're good at this stuff, right? So I'll, I'll, I'll take my, I'll take my best shot, yeah. yeah. Let, let me just say, Lou, that's a lot more lead time I usually get. <laughs> <laughs> you are the president. <laughs> uh, so I think our company has a bit of a, an interesting vantage point on, all, on, on what's going on in the U.S. economy. Um, and... It, you know, in addition to our utility in Florida, where we're one of the largest utilities in the United States, uh, we serve about half of the, uh, the folks in Florida. We also have uh, power generation facilities in uh, 26 other states, and we're the second largest generator of power uh, in the country um, from a capacity standpoint. So let me start from a macro perspective and give you a little uh, feedback on what we're seeing there. And so one of the <laughs> measures we look at, of course, would be total, total power production. And uh, you know that's pretty correlated with economic activity. Uh, clearly, after falling dramatically in really 08 and 09, uh, we've seen total electricity production uh, start to come back. Um, it's been rising steadily, but frankly, at a, at a slow, slow rate. Uh, just to give you a couple of data points, uh, or at least one data point. December of 2010, uh, electrical generation was up 3.1% uh, relative to uh, the prior year. Uh, now, uh, with that, you know, having said that, its overall demand for electricity is nowhere near where our, we, our industry peaked in 2007. So in some regards, this is a good news, bad news story. If you think about it from um, a consumer standpoint, uh, the combination of weak demand, plentiful natural gas, um, and an abundant supply of power, uh, prices for uh, electricity, our fuel that we use, and thanks to people, some of our suppliers like Jeff's company, even our equipment uh, that we buy has come down in price some. So it's really resulted in meaningful savings for consumers. Uh, hopefully that will offset what they're seeing with the, the, the gas pump uh, these days. Uh, but at the same time, lower demand is causing overall slower growth in, in our uh, electric power sector. Now, one thing about our sector is we uh, have very long lead times in terms of uh, building for the future. So uh, our industry continues to invest and is investing pretty significantly. Um, I only have data for the shareholder-owned utilities. And of course, there's some other uh, municipals and co-ops uh, in the industry, but uh, the shareholder-owned utilities are expecting to invest $85 billion uh, this year in new CapEx. That's hot off the press, the number I did, we just got yesterday. And those investments will be in things like new power plants, new transmission, uh, renewable generation, uh, smart grid technology, and other upgrades to the nation's electrical system. All of this will create jobs and uh, really increase the, you know, our economic competitiveness in the, in the years ahead. Uh, you know, but really with robust uh, demand that, you know, pre you know, but if we had demand at where we were in the old seven kind of time frame, we could invest more is what I'm really trying to say. And uh, with a little more clarity on some of the, uh, in the regulatory picture um, in regard to areas like transmission, nuclear, uh, clean energy, uh, things of that sort, uh, the industry really does have the wherewithal to invest a lot more. Uh, and is, is prepared to do so. Uh, so that's kind of the macro perspective. From a Florida perspective, uh, what we're seeing is kind of a mixed, uh, uh, mixed read at this point. Uh, our, our state clearly is bottomed and is starting to improve. We were one of the first states into the recession and most likely are going to be one of the last ones out. Um, our unemployment rate is still high, 12%. Uh, but from a utility standpoint, we saw for the first time in three years significant customer growth last year, and that growth has been gradually accelerating as, as we uh, went through the year and, and what we've seen so far uh, this year. Uh, you know, we added approximately 30,000 customers uh, last year, and we're basically every month looking at that just gradually going up. So, so that's a, a pretty good sign uh, for what's going on in Florida. Um, 
but we see very, very little improvement in the home construction market. And as a utility, we, we see that early on because we have to invest in facilities whenever developers want to build uh, you know, new you know, housing developments and things of that, of that sort. So while the worst is clearly behind us, or at least it seems to be behind us, we still have some distance to travel to get back to what I would consider to be uh, normal growth for our, for our business. Um, uh, I know you're interested in clean energy, so I'll just comment on that for a second. Uh, on a national front, uh, we saw nobody was banging at our door, nobody was listening to our phone calls uh, for quite a while and selling uh, more renewable power. Uh, the fourth quarter uh, of last year, we picked up a lot of orders, and we're seeing that momentum continue uh, so far this year. So we're, we're cautiously optimistic about that, but we're still nowhere near the rate that we were hoping to be at at this point in time and nowhere near the rate that we were at, uh, let's say, back in 2007 or something like that. Um, again, there's a bit of a good news story there. Is, uh, our suppliers uh, have, uh, have, have, become, have, have developed, much, continue to invest in the technology. Uh, wind power especially is getting to be even more competitive, lower cost. Uh, we capture more wind and that sort of thing. So. Uh, Wind is very, very competitive with all other forms of electricity generation at this point. And we're seeing a very similar story on the solar side, although solar still has a, a ways to go. Um, so overall, we're you know, cautiously optimistic, but we still have a ways to go. And uh, hopefully through the work of this great council, we'll, we'll, we'll keep uh, jobs growing and keep the economy growing. Great, Lou, thanks. Ken was going to give an update on uh, small business and yeah, and just general what, economy. Yeah, what I thought I would do both is, as you said, general economy and small business. And one say that traditionally we've been a leading indicator by around six to 12 months for the economic environment. And that's been pretty clear as you look at the past 15, 20 years. What I'll go through is what I'm seeing, but also some concerns that that may not be the case going forward. Because I think based on what's happened. Meaning you may not be the same kind that's of That's right. We may not be the same that. type of indicator because I think with the event that happened once in 100 years, there, there are some changes in consumer behavior. And there are some changes from a regulatory standpoint that might slow down that uh, growth. But the first uh, point I would make is if we look at card billings, and in our business model, we have large percentage, 70% of our billing, 713 billion, is driven by people who pay in full at the end of the month. It's a major difference. And then you have 30% that revolve. And there's some fundamental differences, and you can see the change in revolving behavior that has taken place. In the U.S., the billings growth rate was 13 percent, but the overall industry growth rate for the credit card side was 6 percent. So already you can start to see a demarcation, and I'll talk about some of the drivers of that demarcation. And the question is really, in, given the credit situation, if we're going to see a real increase uh, in that 6% number. Uh, so that's something that I think we just need to focus on. <clears throat> Small business, uh, we have seen real improvements uh, in the last year. Uh, Small business was a big concern over the last 12 to 18, 18 months. But in 2010, uh, we saw a comeback. So that growth rate was uh, in double digits, low double digits, but, but good, strong growth. And that is continuing. And small businesses we characterize anywhere from 10 billion to 1 billion in sales. The other side is commercial, large commercial card, which is mid-size, uh, uh, mid-size companies, and that th that's the group that's really 10 million to 1 billion is mid-size companies. Small businesses below that, but middle market and large corporate, we saw a 19 percent growth rate, uh, which we were in negative territory 12 to 18 months ago. 19% growth rate, and that is holding uh, pretty well. And frankly, in conversations with a number of my technology peers, they are seeing good growth uh, on the technology side. Uh, so I think that is uh, certainly encouraging. And across almost every industry category, period, we're seeing positive growth. A number of categories in uh, low to mid double digits, other categories in the 5 to 7% range. Uh, and so that is uh, quite encouraging. 
What we're seeing, though, is a real demarcation <coughs> between the affluent consumer and the lower middle class consumer. So the growth rates for the luxury affluent spender have been very strong. So you're seeing in some segments growth rates of over 35% for spending. You're seeing a switch of what I'd call traditional affluence who uh, comprised, uh, while they were 10% of the people who were spending, they were driving 60 to 70% of the spending. They are now driving 38% of the spending. And what you're seeing are newcomers, younger people, who are in fact not as affluent, dramatically increasing their affluent purchasing. And we're trying to get behind that dynamic. Uh, because it's an interesting dynamic that you have a young group. Obviously, a substantial percentage of that group is doing their spending online. Uh, and I'll get back to that, and that's an important change. Um, just on online spend, uh, and this is, I think, a sea change uh, that's going on. Fastest growth category is online spend. So our online spend is growing 20% plus. PayPal is growing 20% plus. We're generating easily in excess of $100 billion in online spend. PayPal is generating around $92 billion in online spend. The penetration of retail is only 10 to 15% of online spend. So that's a long uh, runway. Uh, obviously, if they're online, then they're being serviced online. The short-term impacts from an employment standpoint could be substantial because the productivity is going to be impacted. From a growth standpoint over the next three, five, ten years, I think you're going to see an increase in employment as a result of that growth, but I do think there is going to be a short-term hit, uh, and that's a concern uh, as I look at that. Uh, so I think that's important uh, to focus on. Uh, I think that what you're seeing from a behavior standpoint as far as revolving credit and lending is people are revolving less. Given the environment, they're saying, I'm going to pull back. I want to be more responsible uh, in my lending. Uh, people have less access to credit. I think one of the consequences of the Credit Card Act, which generally I think was very good, is the impact has been on risk-based pricing. So people who are less credit worthy, institutions are less willing to extend that credit to them, and that's just a balancing that I think is going to be uh, very, very important uh, to go through. If you go to 2010, um, uh, revolving credit balances were down 8%. Uh, we were flat to down 1%. So it's going to take a big change, a major sea change, uh, to go from the, this decline to 5 to 10% growth in AR. Um, I'll just interrupt one second. Uh, sure. The, uh, I think in your industry there was some question as to whether um, consumer patterns were actually changing. They were. When people were uh, <coughs> using the credit card less, or whether this was an aggregation issue, and what you found out was there were a whole bunch of folks on the sort of downstream who just lost their credit cards, defaulted, et cetera. The people who had lost the credit cards that, that they were still using just as much. I just, I wasn't sure how Yeah, here's, was here's the balance. I think that people are not utilizing the credit uh, on their cards as much. So I would say that the change has been more. So there has a, been a change of behavior across yeah, the board. Yeah, there has been a change of behavior. And, and let me give you an example is that the rate that people utilize their lines uh, is in the 20 to 25% range. So you've got 75% of the lines that are out there that are unused, both in consumer and small business. And that's pretty consistent. So that is a, that is a major change. Now, when you ask customers what's the issue, what they will say is uncertainty. Uncertainty about the economic environment. Uh, can they really invest? Are they going to take that risk? So they're being, on one level, one level very rational. But that is a very alarming number to me that 75% of the credit out there is not being used. We're uh, seeing the same thing. Mm -hmm. uh, the city's right. seeing the same thing. That's and our right. book is all credit cards, right? That's right. People so, are paying their balances down. Right. And they're not accessing right. 
the future lines, and then right. and then the banks are pulling back on those. They're taking back the excess, the, the future exposure, just so they don't have it. So, but the concern I have is with the lower middle class, they don't get the access to credit, and those small businesses that have a more riskier profile, at the end of the day, financial institutions are being more conservative because they don't have the ability to dynamically risk-based price. And so sorting out that balance, but I think this behavioral change is something we really need to focus on, as well as how do we make credit more available uh, to uh, certain segments going forward. The, the credit performance is improving dramatically. So in the uh, fourth quarter of 2009, the write-off rate was 10.1% for the industry. Uh, the write-off rate at the end of 2010 was 7.7. .7. And to give you a sense at which we're hopefully a leading indicator, in 2009 we were 7.5. We finished the year um, at 4.4. And in January we were 3.8% uh, write-off rate. So we're very much back in our normalized range. And I would say so for us, while we're the leader, I'm encouraged by what's happening with the industry overall. Now, there's a dynamic that's going on here is people are taking the benefit of their credit provision. Some are putting it right to the bottom line and some are investing. Uh, what we've done is we've invested a substantial portion of that benefit, which is pretty much a one-time benefit. So that benefit is going to roll off at the end of this year. And so what's going to be interesting, while a number of financial institutions are reporting good profits, what's going to be critical is how they've invested that excess provision. Uh, and that's why some analysts are really questioning, particularly in the credit card industry, if the earnings growth is going to continue. Uh, but I think some institutions have taken those benefits and they've, and they've invested in them, and that should uh, bode well. So I think um, uh, clearly uh, consumers and small businesses, uh, we've got to solve this credit issue. Uh, making sure that the lower middle class has more access to credit because now they have less access to credit. So in summary, what I would say is we need to stay very focused on this demarcation between the affluent uh, and the lower middle class. There are clearly two very separate dynamics going on, and it's not necessarily, as I look at it, that we're going to see the trickle down that we've seen in past economic crises over time. Second is, uh, how do we change and make people aware and give them incentives to utilize the existing lines? Because to have 75% of the lines not utilized from an industry standpoint is highly concerning if we're going to drive growth. Uh, and third uh, is access uh, to credit. Um, the last piece I would also mention is this impact of online spending on traditional retail is a very, very important impact because while it is very productive, the growth rates are tremendous, we're investing in it heavily. In the short term, even with traditional retailers, the fastest growth part of their business is online spending. And that will have a short-term impact, and we just have to balance that off and understand what are some other industries that we can really drive towards that will help with the short-term drive for jobs, as well as plan for uh, what will be the growth opportunities as a result of this move to uh, digital. Great. Right. Darlene runs a small manufacturing exporter. So Darlene, what do you, what do you say? Thank you for having me here today. Well, um, speaking from a small manufacturing company, we are small in uh, Minnesota. Cool stuff. Yeah, that's what I do. Um, <laughs> anyway, our industry tracks uh, manufacturing levels and sales levels, and we use a basis of um, 100 or 2,000 levels. And at our lowest, we were at 67. And January was our best month in three months, we were at 111. So we feel really progressive. We really feel excited that we've hit the bottom. We're now moving back up. 
only the good news, but along with the sad news, is that we become a lot leaner, we become a lot smarter, and we're able to do a lot more with the less people. Um, but manufacturers like myself, we know we want to grow, we want to add business, and we have to add more skilled people. And that's our biggest challenge right now. Even though there's huge unemployment, we cannot find skilled labor to hire. Thanks. But before we go forward, I, Darlene, and, and I don't want to steal any thunder from Penny here, but uh, she's done some uh, really good work uh, on how we build up skills. You're talking about more skilled workers. And so in some places, you've got a very good relationship developed between industry and the local community college, where they'll help design, the businesses will help design the curriculum, hire the folks for who come out of a program that might be a year program, a two-year program. Uh, have you explored that? I mean, in fact, Jeff, uh, your, your plan up at Schenectady is a good model, mm -hmm. uh, where uh, they've linked up, probably have the similar needs to what uh, what your company needs, and, and they've been able to get a pipeline for the workers that they need. Have you been in conversations with folks uh, locally about that? Yes, we definitely have with our community college, with the Tennessee College, and Colleges just just can't they they can't invest the capital to right. have a, a model that you, people could be trained on. Is that a problem? So, right, exactly. So we're trying to come up with a program where they can come into maybe our companies, and, you know, uh, bring partnership or something to help utilize the expensive equipment, but yet we get skilled workers back from that. So yes, we are, but it's a skill process to get there. Great, nice <coughs> Ellen. Great, thanks, Jeff. And um, it, you know, 2010, I, uh, our company, you know, what well, Darlene's company, benefited greatly from a strong recovery. Most manufacturing companies did, um, and what we see is that momentum continues in 2011. And although 2011 doesn't look like it's going to be as high a growth year as 2010 was. It, there's still a lot of positives associated with it. You know, we are large in agriculture. Uh, farmers are making money. Um, they're putting a lot of inputs into the ground to get the most out they can. And that's a very positive thing for all the different kinds of companies who supply the inputs into um, the food chain. Very positive dynamic going there. Automotive. Now, automotive globally grew 20% last year, and this year globally only seems like it's going to be about five. 
but it's positive. In the U.S., it'll probably probably be eight or nine percent, and you know that's good for a lot of the companies that supply whether it's plastics or metal or paint or whatever into the automotive industry. And the truck business has come back as well, so we see that as a positive. In the electronics arena, we see positives going into photovoltaics. Huge year last year. This year, the growth will be probably upwards of 20 percent. Uh, a lot of the materials going into the, the photovoltaic market do come out of plants we have in the United States and, and plants we have around the world. Um, smart tablets, you know, iPads, uh, smartphones, a uh, tremendous amount of growth there and a tremendous amount of advanced materials being used in there. So very positive. The only dark spot on the horizon um, is construction and is construction in the United States. Um, and um, that's something that, that none of us expect really to see much progress in, um, in this year. Now, the interesting part about it is that when you take a look at the demand we've seen, many of our plants are sold out. Um, we are operating at capacity. And what we need to do is have the confidence to invest um, in order to be able to create jobs. And the interesting part of that is it's not my confidence. I got my customer's confidence and their customer's confidence. It builds because the demand signal, you know, if we felt in the first quarter of 2009 the demand signal was about a week long, you know, now we think of it as maybe being about three, four, five months long. But it's nowhere near what we thought it was in 2007 and the beginning of 2008 which we thought it was 18 months long. Now, maybe it really wasn't 18 months, and we have to kind of come to terms with that, but there is that. You know, a couple of sectors um, is very positive for the U.S. on export. If you look at agriculture, you know, over a $30 billion surplus. Um, if you look at chemical and chemical-related products, take pharmaceuticals out, $30 billion surplus. Those are the kind of plants in the United States. We're building two right now, one in Kevlar, um, and one in uh, films for photovoltaics, both will come up this year, uh, two strong areas that we even saw during the, the recession. Um, but it is the capital expenditures that are going to have to really open up to be able to really create jobs. For every job, the, the couple hundred jobs I'm putting in Ohio at that Tedlar plant will create four to five times that many jobs in the community to support that plant. And that's a lot of small business support and, and uh, the heavy machinery in these things, and we probably get some, some of it from you. Um, so we do see that there is that connection, and we have to gain the confidence in capital expenditures to be able to really expand, um, and that is the demand signal. Now, what underscores that, and you can talk about, well, confidence, look what's happening in the Middle East today, what's going to happen, that, that short term, that'll play out, we'll figure that one out. Um, but what it comes down to also is research and development. A lot of the work we do in advanced manufacturing is all based on basic research we do in this country, research and development we do, and there's a connection very clearly in companies like mine between research and development and jobs. And that's something that is not lost on us. We never. Um, uh, decreased our research and development activities during the global financial crisis. We see that as our future. Um, but I think that we have to talk about research and development and its part in creating jobs in this country because that's where you do get the higher order jobs that we all need the engineers, we all need the, um, you know, the technically trained people to be able to support. But, but we're optimistic about 2011. We see we're on that glide path. But we have to do is think about what are those few things we can do to shake some of this loose to get the momentum increasing. Matt? So, Mr. President, the railroad industry is a great kaleidoscope for the U.S. economy. If you would take GDP less technology, we almost mirror that with our units per week. And then we actually saw the recession coming in late 2006. We were doing about 775,000 units a week last one U.S. railroad industry. Uh, the low point was 2009, we got down to 550,000. Last week we did 650,000. So without a doubt, you know, and that's that's week of February with bad weather, without a doubt, we're a lot better than we were in 2009. We're not, we're not near as good as we were in 2006. What did we do in 2009? We furloughed tens of thousands of employees. We parked a bunch of locomotives. We parked 500,000 rail cars. 
And so as this thing has started to come back, we've redeployed all those assets. Uh, we're going to be hiring a significant amount of people this year. Uh, we will have record capital spending of the industry of almost $12 billion. We spent about $80 billion on our highway system in this country. We'll spend almost $12 billion in private capital dollars for the railroad industry. So I, I think that, you know, quite frankly, my belief is the economy is better than what you read. And that you'll, you're going to be pleasantly surprised of what U.S. businesses are going to do in the short term of how this thing starts to come back. Uh, the, the tax bill that uh, uh, you all uh, put forth in uh, late year, you know, personally, thank you very much. but. The, the accelerated depreciation expensing was extremely helpful, and uh, I bought more locomotives because of that. So I mean, that's that's the kind of stuff that drives. So you know, long term, Jeff mentioned you know we have some domestic CEOs. I'm a domestic CEO. We're not we're not moving any of our work out of the country. We are here. We cannot move this railroad. So we're here we're with you the whole time. But I see these companies all over the, all over the, our country that have pulled up plants, pulled up rails, and moved them to different locations. And we're always competing with new plants, Mexico, Canada, China, whatever. And you know, it just it comes back to well, short term we're going to focus on jobs, jobs, jobs. Long term, this whole focus is going to be about the competitiveness of the U.S. workers. And I always just think about, you know, what can we do to make this U.S. worker more competitive? And of course, it starts with education. And then we move to tax policies. I mentioned what we did at the end of the year. Uh, it goes to regulation, which you've identified. Uh, it goes to long-term energy policy, both affordable and available. Uh, and it's those types of things that I think in 10 or 15 and 20 years, we'll look back and say, the U.S. worker can now is a lean, mean fighter machine and can continue to compete, or the U.S. worker, uh, because of those various issues, just can't compete in the global work, workforce. Because what was once a, a domestic uh, set of supply chains and a domestic workforce is never again. That, that horse left the barn. And, and this group of 309 million Americans is going to be competing against Mexico, China, Canada, everywhere around the world. And we see it. We're moving raw materials to these markets, all infinite products back. And we will never get back our ability to just build and, and, and only compete within these ports. And you know that. But, but when we think about the long-term structural issues we have, that's, that's why I hope we will focus on long-term. So that's a pretty good microcosm of what's, what's going on. I'd say it's getting better every day. There's maybe bimodal recovery, rich versus poor. There are certain sectors that are hard hit. And I think the emerging issue is inflation. I mean, would that be what, what people on the table would say? You know, when you think about what we might be worried about three months from now or six months from now, I think it's you know, where does all the volatility lead on a, on a macroeconomic basis? But I think that's, that's a pretty good synopsis. Okay. You know, to, to, my, my, to the extent that people are concerned about the inflation, very quickly before we move on. Maybe you guys already talked about this, but the, uh, what, you're, what we're seeing right now is the core inflation rate is actually not a problem at all. Uh, and we've looked at it every which way. So if you guys are making plans, uh, that is probably not something that you should be worried about. What is uh, a specific concern in certain sectors is this move in energy prices. Uh, ener and even on energy, it's not utility, it's not electricity prices, it's going to be uh, oil prices in particular. Um, we actually think that uh, we'll be able to ride out uh, the Libya situation uh, and it will stabilize. Um, the food prices really has to do with uh, uh, weather, uh, floods, drought, Fires, heat. Um, I think uh, if you ask John, uh, he would say it has to do with climate change. Uh, but I won't wade into those politics right now because we're here to talk about jobs. Uh, but uh, but, but I, I make that point only only to suggest that the data that we're seeing right now, we're not seeing a broad-based uh, inflation trend. Uh, 
but rather in a very specific uh, sectoral uh, strategy. Tim, fair? Yeah, we, I think that the, um, the basic problem in some sense is that monetary policy in the emerging economies is still very loose. They've been very slow to tighten after the crisis, and they're going to have to start to tighten policy. That'll take some of the steam out of this pressure on commodity prices, because they're going to be growing a little more modest pace going forward. But that's going to have to happen if we're going to contain the risk of inflation getting more momentum uh, globally. And that, that, that needs to happen. We can't, of course, control that. Um, but that'll be an important part of doing this. The other thing that you might refer to, it's 2.30 now, I think I can say this, is that um, uh, we're going to try to remind people, just thinking about oil, that we have substantial capacity across the major economies in the strategic reserves of the major economies to uh, deploy those reserves in the event we were to face some particular risk of sustained slot supply disruption. And Hopefully, by reminding people of that and calling attention to the fact that there's a, a, a fair amount of excess capacity in, in OPEC, parts of OPEC now, hopefully that will uh, make it less likely the market still st starts to build in higher prices over time. Won't be perfect protection against that against all circumstances, but it might help a little bit. We've got a few updates on some other activity that's been going on. Maybe Steve, start with you on, uh, on the start of America. Sure. Well, first of all, I should uh, say it's a startup. which was announced three weeks ago. We're still putting things in place. Just hired a CEO a week ago. Thankfully, an entrepreneur helped start Priceline, and then for the last five years has run Malaria No More, a public private partnership focused on getting organizations focused on malaria in Africa. He's a great guy. Uh, we're now assembling a board of entrepreneurs to help guide this, this forward. But the reason it's so important, I really appreciate the president's leadership on this, and really the entire economic team and a lot of the cabinet folks uh, actually spent a whole day in Cleveland uh, on Tuesday just focusing on this issue of, of small business, and, and the president spent probably three, four hours in a variety of different breakout sessions with small business owners, entrepreneurs, building companies uh, to show the importance of, of really celebrating their work and, and really trying to figure out how to take that forward. The reason this is so important, and particularly given we're focused on jobs and competitiveness, uh, is if you look at big business, all the large companies, and you look at small business, they're both important. But as Karen Mills said earlier, the real leverage is the high growth companies that can create significant scale and significant jobs. The last 25 years, uh, 40 million jobs were created by startups, and all the net job growth in our economy was created by startups. So how do we celebrate and accelerate startups, and particularly how do we focus on what's sometimes called speed ups, the company that really have the potential for significant growth. So the main focus of Startup America and this partnership is to get, get the private sector working with the government to try to expand the entrepreneurial ecosystems around our country. They're already working well in some places for some sectors. For example, in Silicon Valley for social media, it's working pretty well right now. But there's many places, including Cleveland and many sectors, where we don't have that robust entrepreneurial ecosystem. So we're working on a variety of programs, you know, startup universities and an entrepreneurs' uh, uh, toolkit, the Entrepreneurs' Mentor Core, a variety of different initiatives are being put on the table. And it's how do you take programs that are working in regions and bring them to scale and shine a spotlight on them. So it's, it's early days, it is a startup, but we welcome all your, your input. Perhaps at the, the next meeting, we'll be able to report on some uh, specific progress and set, you know, be clear on exactly what the priorities are. But I really do appreciate the fact the president and his whole team has really made this a priority because even the simple act of celebrating entrepreneurs, I think, is a major uh, contribution. Now the question is how the private sector supplements that uh, with resources that really help them start new companies and particularly scale the companies with the greatest growth potential. Penny, you want to go through the skills for America? Sure. Uh, in October, the president uh, created Skills for America's Future, which is really a response to what Darlene raised as a problem, which is there are jobs out there, but we don't have the skilled labor to fill the jobs. And what we heard was really a need to better connect the business with our community college system. And while many of you may think you don't have that many employees from the community colleges, I think you would be surprised because our community college system, there are almost 1,200 community colleges in this country, and right now we have over 12 million students employed in, or, or uh, taking courses in full or part-time in the community colleges. So this is an enormous part of our education system, 
and one that we feel that we can better utilize and if the private sector would get more involved. So there's really two things that Skills for America's Future is doing. One is trying to create new partnerships, and we've committed to the President that we will try and achieve his goal of creating 50 new partnerships this year. We're on our way. We have about 10, but we uh, would like each and every one of you to become involved. So uh, please, uh, if you will, I'd love to talk more with you about what we're doing. The second thing that we uh, are doing is to help to be a place that lifts up the importance of workplace development uh, in terms of both policy and execution and communication. So uh, we have our work cut out for us. We're just a few months ahead of Steve's effort, but we too are a startup, but we're moving fast. Our board is quickly getting put in place. We do have a, an executive director uh, that has been hired a couple months ago, and we're out also um, out in many communities participating with Secretary Duncan or Secretary Solis at various conferences trying to get the word out. So we'd love your participation. Great. Thanks, Penny. Eric, you want to give an update on PCAST? Well, I'll, I'll, I'll be brief, but um, you know, as, as you know, Mr. President, the major focus of PCAST has been the different ways to fuel the engines of innovation in the country. Um, we have been working on a number of different things, the energy report, the health information technology, STEM education. We're going to be going back to those and trying to ask how can we help with the implementation of those reports that are already out and there's already a lot of action happening in part of energy, for example, and education. But what's exciting to me is the connection between PCAST and the Jobs Council because everything we touch in PCAST is about the economy. So we're in the process of finishing up a report on advanced manufacturing that we talked about and the connections between this group and PCAST is really essential before we finalize that. There, there's a new project that we're going to be looking toward with the FDA in terms of that how to streamline regulations with regard to drug approval and clarity and certainty with regard to the paths for approval. And so the ability to connect with this group is particularly exciting to me, and so I'm very grateful that PCAST is represented ex officio on the Jobs Council. Uh, Jim's not here today, but we're off to a good start on the Export Council. Secretary Locke went through it earlier, and we're 15% up last year. 17. Very 17. So we're on our way, and I think that continues to have a lot of life in it, just given how good the uh, the, the uh, you know, markets in Latin America, India continue to be. So that's another, I think, great boost. Well, look, the, uh, first of all, I thought that this was a terrific summary of you know, some of the challenges. Now, obviously, the key for us right now is to translate this into action. Um, uh, just, just a couple observations that I I, I on the table. Uh, first of all, I, I do get a sense that there is a increasing bifurcation in the economy and we're going to have to address it some. And that, that may be a, a big macro issue uh, rather than a, a small But all of you, small to large, are getting very efficient. Productivity uh, keeps on outstripping all our expectations. And the, the phenomenon Ken talked about in terms of online is a classic example. Right? And partly what you're telling me is, is that retail sales jobs are going to be increasingly going the way of the bank teller and the travel agent. And so you've just got a whole swath of employment that is not coming back. Uh, those folks then have to be trained uh, in order to, to attach themselves to the industries of the future. Some of those are going to be service sector jobs in the health care industry or what have you. Uh, thinking about how to, to prepare for changing demographics and increasing demand for services like health care. We've got to solve, uh, but we're going to need some advice from all of you. Uh, but but I, I guess that's part of the reason why this Jobs Council is going to be so important, because you're going to have to help us identify where is the future job for the going, so that we can start closing that gap between uh, the more affluent sectors of the economy and the less affluent sectors. 
going to involve a whole range of things. Part of it's going to be skills development. Part of it's going to be uh, tax policy, and fiscal policy. Part of it's uh, going to be how we can get startups like Steve's that actually hire. But, but if you ask me what worries me about the prospects for our economy in the long run, that's what worries me. Partly because uh, you know, it goes back to the image of uh, Henry Ford, when you know, folks asked him, well, why are you, are you paying these folks such good wages? And he said, well, I want all my employees to be buying a Ford. Uh, and, and the concern I've got right now is I don't know exactly where your future's customers come from if they don't have jobs. Steve Chu, uh, 
who else from the cabinet is important on this. But that would be a terrific area of my way support. It's a tragedy. You know, I, I'm sure it's just, you know, one of the things we talked about as a group before you came was we want to take on a few things that we can move the needle pretty quickly. And, and I think this fits that bill. It's been discussed. The program is shaped. You know, I think a lot of this stuff is financeable even in the capital markets today without any stimulus or anything like that. So this is one role we will take on, Mr. President, because I, I, I just think it's, it's out there and we ought to be focused on a few things that can move the needle quickly. I think this one, I'm sorry, but go ahead. No, no, I was going to say, Mr. President, there's an idea that it's something I think that could be done within your existing authority, which is a green real estate appraisal, a standardized green real estate appraisal, um, where you institutionalize how appraisers value energy savings within the buildings. And it, I don't believe it requires legislation. I think it's something that could be done regulatorily and get comment and then create that kind of standard that could elevate this notion of the importance to the value of a piece of real estate of its energy efficiency. Well, so, so that's a, an idea. <coughs> One last comment, because a number of people mentioned issues of regulatory barriers or burdens. I have told this to Jeff. I mentioned this to some of you. Uh, I am absolutely committed and serious to figuring out how we eliminate regulatory barriers that are outdated, are necessary, are impeding uh, job work. Now, there are going to be uh, equities that have to be looked at because some of these regulations make sure the kids aren't swallowing mercury and make sure that. The air is breathable and our workers are protected. Uh, and so uh, there's, we're not, if you go around this table, uh, we're not going to get 100% agreement on every uh, regulatory. Uh, but I am interested in finding some select areas where we can make some big progress. Uh, Eric mentioned the FDA. Uh, I've gotten a lot of commentary about uh, the fact that we designed the FDA with a lot of smart people, good people at the FDA, but essentially their model was designed for you know, the kind of medical devices you see in you know, museums uh, aren't necessarily well designed for uh, biotechnology and uh, advances in medicine. Uh, and so that'd be an area where getting a group to think strategically about how do we not, it's not just a matter of eliminating one regulation. It's about designing these regulatory bodies so that they are up to speed and more responsive to, uh, to a dynamic economy. That's something that uh, Jeff would be worried about. We've got some appetite around the table, so I think we'll take you up on that one, Mr. President. All right. So we're going to spend the rest of the day kind of going through how we go in the next uh, 60, 90 days. I, I think uh, you've given us some, some things to focus on. I think what we're going to try to do is be you know, short and long-term focused, but uh, really focused on jobs and competitiveness. Um, and we want to see you, uh, you know, soon. And maybe the next meeting in the field, you know, someplace outside of Washington, I think it's great. But I think we really kind of anxious to get going. Or anything else no, 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 no. I, I think that uh, you guys are right on track. I'll go back to what you said earlier. Uh, the focus here has to be on jobs here in the United States. Uh, and, and, and the reason is because our ability to sustain long term things like uh, an aggressive trade agenda or investments in our or investments in education will depend on the degree to which the American people feel a stake in your success. If, if, if they don't, if you, if, if you guys are going gangbusters uh, and making big profits, but they don't feel like uh, their benefit as a consequence, uh, as a consequence of increases in productivity, uh, then they will pull back from things like uh, 
because their attitude will be, let's, uh, let's just uh, look out for ourselves. Um, investments in research and development. Instinctively, people appreciate and understand the need for innovation and technology, but if they think that the byproducts of that investment uh, never reach them, other than as consumers, then they may say to themselves, why do I want to uh, pay taxes in support of that? Let the private sector do it on its own. And most of us here, I think, understand that uh, a lot of the basic research uh, ends up being prohibited for any one company to take on. So, uh, so, so your mission is so important, not only uh, for the short term. Uh, it really it will help shape the degree to which everybody feels like the American dream is still available uh, for all of us. Uh, and that will help unify the country and bring it together. Uh, it, it, and it speaks to the whole confidence issue that I think everybody's in. Thank you so much for the great work. Thank you. Appreciate it.